Having been reached, I want to welcome everyone to this public meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted, conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on the link in the town's webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and, and noticed thereof has been posted and mailed to all parties at interest. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. I'd like to take a roll call. Board members, as your name are called, please unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourself back on mute. Joan O'Meara. She is here. Maybe she has, hold on a second. Joan, can you hear her? I cannot. Wait, Joan? Yeah. There I'm we here. Go. There we go. Keith Langsdale. I'm here. Tammy Park. Here. Dylan Maxfield. Here. Sharon Waldman. Here. Peter Barrick. Here. Bob Greeny. I saw Bob. I think I, I, saw, I know he's there. He is. There we see you. Bob's here. Yeah, I I can't unmute. <laughs> there we we got gotcha. you. <laughs> and it's Craig Meadows. Are you hearing me now? Yep, we're hearing you now. Okay. Is Craig Meadows here? Uh, not uh, unless not this phone number from the attendees is his. Uh, give me a second. Let me look up. What's this number eight? eight oh, I think this is him actually. Eight six six. Okay, uh, Craig, you're. I'm. I'm gonna. Let's see here. Allowed to talk. Craig, are are you there? I am here. Okay. All right. We've got everybody in attendance. Great. The zoning board of appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst zoning bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all our decisions. There are copies of Section 10.38 available for the public use. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Tonight, we are conducting a public meeting to consider ZBA's rules and regulations. In a public meeting, the board deliberates on a matter and is not generally an opportunity for public comment. Any public comment will be at the chair's discretion. Tonight, we have the following agenda. Consideration of the rules and regulations of the Board of Appeals, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and after the rules and regulations, the board will entertain public comment on any matter not on tonight's agenda. Um, tonight, sitting for tonight's agenda are our regular board members who have already introduced themselves um, and answered the roll call. Maureen Pollock of the town staff, Christine Brustup, David Wakasevitz. I think I pronounced that right. Waska. Uh, please say it again. Waskevitz. Watskevitz. Yep. And uh, we also have with us tonight Jonathan Witten of KP Law, who is working with us on reviewing our rules and regulations. Before we begin the, the meeting, I just wanted to say I've reviewed the rules and regs, and my initial impression was just to make some technical changes to incorporate the change from town meeting form of government to council. But after discussing these rules and regs with staff and with John Witten, I think we should have, a, at minimum, have separate sections for each type of action we take special permit, various comprehensive uh, variances and comprehensive permits. They all have different deadlines, they have different requirements. It makes, it would make sense and would make, uh, it would help in the clarity for them to all have, each have a separate section of the, of the bylaws. 
And I also think there's merit to laying out more specific procedures and requirements for comprehensive permits. There are two fundamental benefits in doing so, I think. The first is it provides the board and the applicant developer with a clear recitation of the process and requirements of the comprehensive permit process. I think that clarity would benefit everybody involved in, in a comprehensive permit. And secondly, I think the public will be better served and more informed of the process and of the, the proposal and, and of the process the board will use and how they can be involved in consideration of a comprehensive permit. So if the board decides to consider more extensive changes to the rules and regulations than you have already received via email from staff, I would work with the town staff and our outside council to have a draft, to try to have a draft to you next week so that you could, changes could be considered at next week's ZBA meeting. Before I ask John to discuss some of the changes uh, he would suggest we consider, I wanna ask staff if they have any additional comments or if any board members has a question or a comment on our rules and regulations. Uh, yeah, this is Keith. Um, yes, I have a few things that I had questions about, uh, but they they skip through the whole thing. So, uh, do I? Do you want me to ask all those now, or do we? Are we going to go through it and address each section? I, we go through it. I think um, it would be really helpful if you would you would elicit your uh, comments now, Keith. I okay. think that would be beneficial. And, and if some of those are, you know, technical, just moving to, yeah. you know, five and three members, I think we've got those, but other ones, please, please go through it as serially right now. Okay. Under quorum, yep. uh, it states four members, associate members shall constitute the panel for all public hearings or public meetings. Now, I understand that a quorum is the four of the five, but at the top uh, under section one, members and officers, the Zoning Board of Appeals should consist of five regular and four associate members, all residents, blah, blah, blah. So under quorum, it says that four members shall constitute the panel for all public hearings or public meetings. That seems to me a little confusing because we've said five and now we're saying four will constitute the panel. We're talking about four members being the quorum of the panel, but we're taught, but we're, what we need to say is that there are five members will constitute the panel. Right? I don't know. Well, I think what it's saying is that, that the panel and uh, John or staff, please help. I think what it's saying is that this, that the panel can act with a quorum of four members that it would okay, constitute I don't think a it panel says for that. I think, I think it's confusing. I don't think yeah. it says that. It, because what it says is four members shall constitute the panel for all public hearings or public meetings. So I, I think it could be stated more clearly by saying four members would constitute a quorum allowing and, um, and I think yeah. by a quorum, um, I think it says three members. Yeah, I see. Yeah, Mr. yeah. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, that this, this is yep. this is one of I think a, a good example of why it, the board should consider segregating these three different permit processes that you do, as well as review appeals to the building commissioner. A quorum of the board is actually three, not four. A special permit requires four affirmative votes. A variance requires four affirmative votes but the board can conduct business with a quorum and a quorum of a five member body is three. Now that means if there are only three members present and I'm a special permit or a variance applicant, I'm gonna ask you for an extension of time, but you would be constituted as a quorum and you could grant me that extension of time. So this is a really important point. The quorum is different than the necessary quantum of votes needed to pass a special permit or variance. And it's also relevant because a comprehensive permit only requires a majority vote of the board and the board is five, a majority would be three. 
So depending on what my application is, is going to determine what the quantum of vote I need. But in all cases, a quorum of the Board of Appeals will be three, not four. So you could take, you couldn't approve certain, um, there's some actions you cannot take with three, but you can meet as a board and you, there are actions you can take with just a simple majority, which it, is a quorum. Exactly. And for example, the most important one would be to request the continuation of time or mm -hmm. to do other business that would be non-adjudicative. Um, you know, there, there might be a million reasons why three members of the board would want to take action. It might be a staff issue. It might be hiring a consultant. There are a lot of reasons why the board could continue as three. You wouldn't be able to vote on my special permit or my variance, but you could still commence to do business. So it's an important issue and I think easily fixed, but the, that would be kind of one of the procedural things, Steve, that you and I, Mr. Chairman, that you and I talked about, which is to kind of clarify what is required for each of the different roles you all play, depending on what night of the, the month you're hearing my application. So Steve, uh, m one of my questions then I guess is, we were told that when we went from a three bo member board to a five member board, it would take at least four members to approve a, a special uh, zoning request, uh, but And that's correct. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's correct. That still but, is going to be the that, case. But now you're talking about a quorum being three, which I understand. So what what powers does that quorum have? So sometimes really critical powers. So let's say that the board is running out of time on rendering a decision for a variance or a special permit. You're at the 155th day on a on a special permit. You're on the hundredth day for a variance, but there's a snowstorm and only three members show up that is sufficient to uh, accept an extension from the applicant. So you can conduct business as the Amherst Board of Appeals just with three members. You cannot find the fourth vote to grant me the special permit or to grant me the variance, but you can still conduct essential business. So it is really important, especially when we have wet winters that we have or people get sick or they're on vacation. So if you have cor quorum problems, which a lot of boards do from time to time, the, the three members can still take action, but not render an adjudicative decision, special permit or variance. So a quorum of a five member body is three. The requisite number of votes for a special permit is four, and the requisite number of votes for a variance is four, pursuant to the statute. So you do, you, you may end up being a quorum of three that is going to take an essential action. It's not at all uncommon. Can you take public testimony with three? No, no, and this not is important. Yet. That's, yeah, that's the key. Yeah, so you, you want to be very careful of that. Mm -hmm. So you could meet for the sole purpose of granting my extension of time so that I can get a full fair hearing. Because if there's only three members there, and you, you've run out of the clock, now the applicant is in big trouble. And the board's in big trouble because the board can't vote to deny and the board can't vote to approve. So both parties are gonna want an extension of time. Excuse me, if later on in the, in the uh, uh, rules and regulations, it talks about if that the board does not meet the time, then uh, time in which they need to make the decision, then it goes to an, aut an automatic acceptance of the application. So if you end up th three member board at that end of time, the the applicant doesn't have to ask for an extension. The applicant can just say, okay, then I get what I want. So the constructive approval approach, when an applicant takes that, it'll be the last time he or she or it will ever be favorably reviewed by the Board of Appeals. So a good applicant is never going to play that card or they're going to play it very carefully. 
And if that were to ever happen and the board was up against that, that's where my advice would be to call, call us. We will call the applicant or call their counsel because it's you know, not a dirty trick, but it's an unfair trick to play. So most applicants will play ball because they'll understand that there's a snowstorm or someone is sick. I recommend that that come out of your regulations. That's inherently punitive. You don't wanna be punishing yourself take out the constructive language from your regs. It's a, statutory, it's a statutory requirement, and there's a lot of case law on it. You don't need to have that punitive aspect in the regs. If I'm on my last day, and there isn't four members for my special permit, if I don't give the board an extension, then I cannot foresee favorable treatment or even equitable treatment down the line. And that is just a good rule of thumb that most applicants and developers are aware of. You play the constructive approval card only when the board just blows it. You know, the board just ignores the requirements. When it's a crisis or there's a storm or someone's sick, that kind of bad faith approach doesn't work well. It's a small community in Massachusetts and everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So I, I, it won't happen. And if it does happen, it'll be an outlier. I will come to the board and I'll say, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I really need to grant you an extension of time so you can have the full complement, four members, five members of the board. It, 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 I'm not too worried about that. It's a fair question, but I'm not worried about it. And I really don't think you should have that piece in the rigs as well. Okay, well, it's good, it's good to know in terms of sitting on the board, if that happens, that we need to come to you and say, yeah. help us, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you never want to lose on a constructive approval. It, right. it, first of all, the, the neighborhood goes nuts. I mean, because it almost looks like the board has abdicated any responsibility. Yeah. It's really the worst possible outcome. Tammy, did you have a question? I do. I'm just, um, I, I would um, appreciate it if we can talk, if you can point to the sections that you're talking about as we go along, because I'm not as familiar with them as you are. And so I'm struggling by going page to page to figure out exactly what you're talking about. And so I see where we are talking about the uh, three member quorum is in section three, and then it looks like the extension is uh, 2.10. But I just want to make sure that we're, that we're all on the same page when we're discussing these, if you don't mind. No, good. that's, that's good a good reminder. point. Yeah. Right. Thank yep. you. Keith, do you have some other questions? Oh, uh, some other yeah. comments? Um, under voting, I'm running what down. What section is that? Oh, uh, 2.8. Uh, section 2, yeah. <clears throat> 2.8. Uh, it's just a little technical stuff. I mean, at the end of uh, eight, uh, at the end of the red, the provisions, the regulations will be available to board members, blah, blah, blah. There's a number eight. I don't understand why that's there. It, it doesn't. That's deleted. It's a deletion. Okay. Where it says 2.8. Okay. And then nine. Uh, nine. 2.9. 2.9. Yeah, two, mm -hmm. same one. Said so 2.9. We can't reopen the hearing that night. Is that what is being said here? A motion and vote by the board to reconsider during a duly constituted public meeting. That's one. And two, advertising and notifying abutters in accordance with the chapter four, section 11. Uh, uh, chapter 40. Um, so if the public hearing is closed, we can't reopen it that night. We can only vote to reconsider and then it has to go through, what, another two week cycle? before we can reopen the public hearing? Yes, w w once the hearing is closed, the public is being told there'll be no new testimony. So the public is being informed, you don't have to show up anymore. I mean, I'm saying that cynically to just to prove yeah. the point. If the board wants to accept new testimony, it has to re-advertise for a proper public hearing. So, and that is the two week, 14 days in advance of the public hearing. Okay. Uh... And then again, just a uh, typographical thing. At the end of nine, there's a one. And I don't know why that's there. 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 
You mean the 2.10, 2.10? Yeah, right above it is a one. Uh, I, I, I am not really sure what you're pointing at, but it might be that it's a deletion. Does it have a strike through? No. <laughs> I don't, I don't know where or did the other one that I talked about eight that doesn't have a strike through. Yeah, but the text does. The text. My, mine does not match what Keith is saying. I don't have a strike through. I don't have a one. So uh, Keith, if you look at my screen. So 2.8 this this will obviously uh, John Witten is going to review this. So I guess I think your comments are it may be moot uh, if it's uh, about the track changes, but the 2.8, this, this paragraph right here is deleted. So I, I think it's part of that. Um, and then I, I, again, I don't really know what you're talking about for the 2.8. Okay, well, I'm, I'm looking at what I got from you. It Which is this. Look, it doesn't look like this because there aren't any strikeouts in the copy that I have. There's only the red. Oh, so, hmm. Hmm. Oh. Okay, only the red. Yeah, I, I don't know. This is what I emailed you, Keith, and then I also emailed you uh, the clean copy. Did everyone else get this version? I, I don't have that. The version that I got looks like what Keith is describing. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Do we want to have Keith share his screen so we can see what he sees? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, this is, uh, well, this is what I thought I had emailed everyone. So, um, copy I got. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to stop sharing then. All right. Well, um, Maureen, yeah, I got both yeah. a, a clean copy and a strike through copy. So, mine, okay. you were both attached to mine. So. Oh, okay. It, so, yeah. So, my question is did, did all the members get a copy that I had? The track changes. I do not have that, but I'm looking through my emails to see if it I might. It might be one of those scenarios that once you open, so the 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 file uh, is called. Uh, it's like rules and regs, and at the end of the file name, it says track changes. And so I think if if you're not familiar with Microsoft Word, you would need to go to one of the ribbon to the ribbons at the top and then go to the the tab where it says review and then click show markups so maybe that was an error on my part of not uh specifying that and i'm working yeah i'm trying to find that myself yeah Warren. so if you go to the top so uh hold on a second so let me share my screen yeah but I, what i'm trying to find is what was the date that these came out on that maybe that would help us all that you sent us these the data that uh i sent it like a couple of days ago i believe it was, yeah i think it was tuesday morning uh, tuesday morning okay all right and there was one clean copy and then one that said track changes on it yep we we got those two copies uh the clean copy and the track changes but our track changes copy uh doesn't include the crossed out deletions. It just includes uh, markers in the right hand margin uh, indicating wh where you made changes. Uh, and then in the body of the text, we see the new text. Okay. But we don't see what you're taking out unless we go back and look at the, uh, the clean copy. Got it. And so if everyone can take a look at up here where my mouse is, where it says review, if you click there and go sh yeah. um, here, it says, I think it says show, what would you do? You, you would click all markup. And that should show the additions and deletions or su suggestions. That yeah. Yep. Does that work for people? I'm I'm still on Maureen's uh, screen. I can't do anything with mine. 
go up to the top of your screen and, and where it says. Well, um, now it's okay. Now I'm back on mine. Okay. Um, okay. Then the other thing that I have is uh, under section two application requirements. Um, under initial application, it says each application shall be submitted with one full size hard copy set of all plans and materials. Additionally, each application shall be accompanied by one digital version of all plans and information. My question is this, uh, at least in the past, um, everything we've, everything I've gotten digitally has been incredibly hard to read because it's so small, it's, you, you can't read the dimensions and, and a lot of other things. And there have been times when we ha I had to wait until we got to the hearing itself to see finally the large plan to be able to distinguish what the plans are, are uh, enum enumerating. If now we're going to be dealing online most of the time for a while, is, is there a way to make sure that this digital version is readable? That's a good question, Keith. So, um, so for the last, so in my time here, especially in the last year, you were, you were on the board up until last year and yeah. you, you've, uh, taken a break for the last year. So since then, we have required that, you know, if the hard copy is legible um, and, and you can read easily on like 11 by 17, that's acceptable. And for the most part, it is uh, fine. And I haven't heard any complaints over the last year. Um, but for the scenarios that 11 by 17 or a letter size piece of paper just doesn't cut it, then of course we would require that the applicant provide full scale, you know, 24 by 36 pieces of um, a, a plan set. So it's a case by case basis. My question though is about digital, the digital Did, version yeah. of the plans, not the hard copy. Mm -hmm. I, I never had a hard, we never had a, a problem with the hard copy, but a lot of times we didn't get that until we got to the, the meeting itself, the hearing. Do, do other people have uh, issues with digital copies of the existing members of, that have been on the board? Chris? I just wanted to note that there is usually an option to um, make something bigger, usually at the top of the screen when you're looking at that image of the electronic copy. First of all, it's best to download it. When Maureen sends you a, whatever she sends you and you click on an image, you have to download it first and then you can manipulate it. Once you've downloaded it, you can usually click on a plus sign that will make whatever portion of it bigger. And then there's usually a mechanism for moving it around and I understand that it's um, awkward but it is possible to blow it up so that you can look at it more closely. Okay. That's it for me. That works. Thank you. <laughs> well I'm, no I'm calling. All right. So I don't I don't know where Joan is. Uh, I can sort of hear her talk, but Maureen. Yeah. Oh, are you the phone number? I am. I got booted off. Oh. Okay. That's all right. Well, this works fine too. <laughs> I'm not late. All right. So. Uh, does any other, I'm going to put Joan on mute for a second. Or I guess maybe it wasn't Joan. Um, 
Does anyone have any uh, comments or questions from reviewing the, the rules and regs? So I get Steve. I don't know where Steve is. Steve here? Steve? No, I'm looking for Steve. Oh, Steve. oh there's right. Steve. Oh, it looks like he got booted off and he's coming back. Steve? Hmm. Hi, Steve. He doesn't have his microphone. He only has his video. Oh, is that it? Alrighty. Steve. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. Steve, you don't have a, a microphone. But you can call in. Oh, technology. <laughs> I, I'm back. I'm sorry. No, that's I, okay. I lost uh, all audio there for a second, and I don't know why. <laughs> huh. All right. Well, uh, so we do have uh, uh, some a member of the public. Steve, do you want to see if any members of the public have comments? Well, I think we should have... Or, yeah, discussion with the, I think we should do discussion with the board first and uh, the presentation uh, and then we'll, we'll have discussion from the public at the end of that. But I think we should have the discussion from the board and, the, and our consultant before we go to the public comments. And I'm so, sorry I missed. Uh, I, Keith, had you finished with your, your points? I did, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And was there anybody else that had comments or suggestions? All right, then um, I think we should um, go to John to talk about some of the changes that he su suggests in the process. And then I can talk a little bit about the process that we've used over the next couple of days to make sure that we get this to you before the next meeting so you can uh, go through it and we'll make sure that we understand how to uh, make that the track changes version all work. So, okay. so thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so board members, there, your, your role in life as ZBA members really focuses on four things. You issue special permits, you issue variances, you deal with appeals of the building commissioner's decision, and you issue comprehensive permits. So those four tasks are dramatically different in terms of timelines, in terms of burdens of proof, in terms of the applicable law. So one suggestion is to have the regulations reflect kind of those four different categories. And they, they already do that. I think now that we were talking essentially about the comprehensive permit process, my thought was, and I'm happy to do a draft this weekend for the board's review. My thought was to have the headings, special permit, comprehensive permit, building permit or building decision appeals, and variances, have them as segregated categories, have the plan requirements or the filing requirements be very similar because they will be for many cases the same in terms of what the board is looking for. But of course, you're not gonna require the same plan filings for an appeal of a building commissioner's decision as you would a special permit or a comprehensive permit. So I think the regs could be streamlined procedurally. Uh, there's no, that's not critical of the regs as they are now. I just think it might be a good opportunity to kind of take a, a step back and, and reconfigure them procedurally. I think substantively, the comprehensive permit regs would benefit from a little bit more. And I've spoken to Maureen, I've spoken to the chair and totally respect the fact that Amherst has had a, a pretty good experience with comprehensive permits, more so than a lot of cities and towns in the Commonwealth. So the regs that I had drafted for other communities that I had sent are probably over the top, too aggressive or more aggressive than Amherst needs, especially because Amherst is consistent with local needs. But I do recommend two aspects of comprehensive permit regs for the board to consider. One is to have a requirement for the submission of a pro forma, 
put into the regs. And then the other substantive piece is to provide guidance for the board in the regs as to what to do when you get waiver requests or requests for waivers from a whole host of local regulations. And we talked a little bit about both topics when, when we all met a few weeks ago. I think the regs would benefit from that. Your comprehensive permit regs are waivable. The Board of Appeals could choose to waive any or all aspects of it, depending on the application, or you could hold firm. But I think the pro forma would benefit the board, it'll benefit the applicant, it'll benefit the public, because the pro forma provides the board with uh, at least a roadmap as to how many conditions can you impose before you've killed the project. And I'm saying that from the applicant's perspective. It'll be helpful for the public, because the public will be able to, to understand why you're not pushing for more, or why you are pushing for more. On the waiver requests, my experience with waivers in the comprehensive permit world is, I think, relevant here, which is very few members of the public who haven't dealt with comprehensive permits uh, can understand, because it's not logical, why they've gone to town meeting for the past 50 years, and now the Board of Appeals is giving away all provisions of the zoning bylaw. It's counterintuitive. These aren't variances, so why are you granting all these waivers? I think the regs should reflect the Board's power to grant waivers when the waiver is needed to keep the project from becoming uneconomic or grant a waiver when it's in the best interest of the town to do so because of the, your comprehensive plan, your open space plan, or any other publicly developed document that you want to link them to. So those are my two macro recommendations for the comprehensive permit rules and regs. The examples that I've sent to, to the board uh, go much further than that. They're much more aggressive. And you can always decide to add more pieces later on. This is not a static document, nor should it be. Many boards update their regs many times a year. So I think for the first cut, my recommendation would be those two additions to your comprehensive permit regs. I'm, I'm happy to keep going, Mr. Chairman, but those are, my, yeah, those are kind of the big recommendations. That makes sense. What's the impression of the, I mean, I think that makes sense, uh, to tell you the truth. I think we ought to at least do that. And, um, and John said that he would work on that over the weekend, get something to me and to the staff, and then we could then review and then send out to the board members as early as possible next week so you have some time to consider it. I don't want to drop it on you at the last minute just before the meeting. And even if you, if it is, if you still haven't had enough time, we can wait another week to take care of, to deal with it. But I'd like to, I think we can turn this around fairly quickly and get something to you and give you time to look at it um, and not feel rushed uh, in, in your consideration. But I think, I think your approach makes sense and uh, we'll try to get something out. But I'd like to know if I, hear from other people as well, if other board members have a concern or support the, the approach either way. Or if the staff has a, has a concern. I'm curious by, uh, uh, about something that was just said um, regarding the fact that we have had uh, in Amherst good experiences as far as the ZBA is concerned. I'd like an example of what a bad experience is, <laughs> what the possibilities might be. So there are a lot of bad experiences with the comprehensive permit law in cities and towns across the Commonwealth be because of the waiver issue. So the, the picture, picture this scenario. It's a developed neighborhood of 20,000 square foot single family homes and an applicant is proposing a six story, 200 unit development on a couple acres of land. The, the public perception is how is that possible given the fact that the homes around us are single family, uh, you know, World War II homes on 20,000 square foot lots. So there are a lot of bad experiences from the public's perception because this is in defiance of zoning. So the, the, the knowledge of the comprehensive permit law is in short supply across the Commonwealth. And I think a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of individuals don't understand how it could be that they had to comply with minimum lot size, but this developer does not. It kind of escalates from there. How many, what's the percentage of below market rate units? Well, it's only 25%. So 
So the developer gets a density bonus, but three quarters of those units are market rate selling, you know, if we're in Weston or in Lincoln, they're selling for a million dollars and change. So there are a lot of bad experiences, I think, because board members and the public are used to kind of normative procedures. We're the only state in the nation that develops affordable housing through the comprehensive permit type approach. So it's likely to cause a lot of objections to what happened to zoning. You know, I've been a town meeting member for, for all these years. I thought zoning can only be changed by town meeting. So th that's what I meant by bad experience. Uh, I think the devil's in the details. If you have an applicant who's willing to negotiate with the town, then it's probably a better experience. If you have an applicant who's not willing to negotiate, take it or leave it, then it's going to be a bad experience. And there's a lot of those. And, and I've been involved in a lot of those, a lot of litigation from the comprehensive permit law because developers uh, shoot for the moon and the board of appeals sometimes gets overwhelmed and the neighborhood doesn't understand how that happened. So that's part of the argument, I think, for strong regs, or at least broad regulations, to protect the board against an applicant who's not willing to negotiate with the town. Let me just say this, the comprehensive permit process is a negotiable development, because all zoning is potentially cast aside. So that kind of says it all. That means you're going to have good applicants and you're going to have bad applicants. You're going to have good experiences and bad experiences. And the way to kind of settle the difference is to have some normative foundation. And that to me are good rules and regulations. The thing is though, Amherst is above that because you have met the consistent with local need requirement. So you get to choose now on every comprehensive permit what conditions you want to impose because the developer is not going to have an appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee. By staying at that 10% and above, you are inoculated against an appeal from a developer who's not happy with your decision. So you should always have good experiences because you're not under the gun of an appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee. I think regulations will help you guide a developer because those regs are going to provide the blueprint for where Amherst wants to go with below market rate housing. Any other questions? Christine. Okay, so I have a question about the pro forma. Um, we did not require a pro forma from Beacon. Uh, the ZBA did not require a pro forma. Uh, the pro forma only came into um, play when Beacon applied for uh, the tax incentive that we have here in Amherst. Um, so I guess my question is, um, is that common to require a pro forma? And the other half of that is how honest does the developer need to be in sharing information and how open does the developer need to be? Is it possible that would, we could get a pro forma with redactions that would make it you know, not very informative? Yeah, great, great questions, Christine. So the pro forma is the line in the sand that will instruct the Board of Appeals how many conditions you can impose before the project is rendered uneconomic. So an honest pro forma where the developer puts forward his or her true costs and true profit, because that's all a pro forma is, is a ledger costs and profit, or costs and income rather, and the bottom line is profit. A true pro forma will provide the board with that kind of guidance. So let's say, just as an argument, let's say I come in with an 80 unit comprehensive permit, the board in its wisdom based on staff comments and the board's experience thinks 80 is too much for this particular parcel. And the board is trying to negotiate with me to a, a lower density. And I say, no, I need 80 units. Well, the board member's logical pushback is gonna be, well, what do you mean you need 80? Can you demonstrate that you need 80 to keep the project from being uneconomic. The only honest way of doing that is through a pro forma. How, how honest are they? Well, one of the draft or uh, suggested regs that I had forwarded does require um, a signature, pains and penalties of perjury. And that is really not at all uncommon. When I make an application to a municipality, uh, the board gets to rely on my assertions. 
and even if I don't put it under the pains and penalties of perjury. But if, if, if I'm not honest on the pro forma, then it's going to be very hard for the board to know what kind of conditions to impose or the breadth of the conditions. I think because of the way the statutory scheme works, I think the pro forma is really critical. And so, Kristen, your comment or your question is how common it is. In a municipality that is not consistent with local needs, it's very common because it's the only way the board will know how much negotiation there is. For a community like Amherst that has met the 10% target, it's still relevant because you don't want to bankrupt me. I mean, you, can, you have total control over me. You can deny me or approve my project with two units and I have nothing I can do about it. But if you're supportive of my project, you want to push back, but you don't want to put me into bankruptcy, you need to know what that pro forma is. So, you know, we, we know we can vet a pro forma because there are members of the board and the public and staff who know what construction costs are per square foot. We know what the land costs are because there's a purchase and sale or an option agreement. So it's really very hard to perjure myself on a pro forma. The pro forma is a snapshot in time. Numbers, of course, just changed the past eight weeks. Uh, but putting that kind of issue aside, no, they're reliable and really, really important. They're a guide map or a roadmap and a, a guidance document for the board. All right, any other thoughts, comments? Questions from board members? Christine? Go ahead. Nope. Oh, unmute yourself. Okay. You so the second question is what form would the um, section on waivers be? What format would it be? Would it describe the kinds of waivers that can be uh, requested and what the criteria might be for granting the waivers or? How would you um, how would you format the section on waivers? Yeah, I think it, it, you you answered it in the second part, Christine, which is I think the waiver section has to be inclusive of the Board of Appeals has the authority to grant waivers from all local rules and regulations, with the three exceptions we talked about a couple of weeks ago: mm -hmm. Title Five, the State Building Code, and the Wetlands Protection Act. But the board is looking for justification for the basis for these waivers. And there are two ways of framing that. One is an economic justification. If you don't give me the waiver, the project will be uneconomic and I'm going to not be successful. The other is a health and safety waiver. I need this waiver because it makes sense to have a dead end road longer than your subdivision regulations. I need this waiver to not build a sidewalk on both sides of the street because there's a steep vertical curve or steep vertical cut. So uh, that's my sense, Christine, on, on the waivers. There's an economic mm -hmm. justification, and then there's a planning justification. And the board, in its wisdom, may choose one over the other or may require both. But I, I just think it should be, or, or the board should consider kind of having that as part of your, your regs. Mm -hmm. sure. Good point. OK. Uh, one more. Go ahead, Christine. <laughs> Sorry for dominating the conversation, but um, I wondered, my, my feeling about trying to get the, these um, changes to the rules and regs done sooner rather than later was because we had the uh, application that we know is coming. And I wondered, um, do the rules and regs have to be in place before we yeah. receive the application in order for them to be enforced or can the rules and regs sort of come along at the same time and you know the board can rely on those rules and regs yeah another great question as a general rule the regs have to be in place before the filing of the application with the, the town or city clerk so yeah my my advice would be if the board wanted to make changes that it feels are important for now you should adopt those before if you can you can't control this sometimes but you should adopt those changes before you get an application for a new special permit, a new variance, a new comprehensive permit. Yeah, you want the regs filed with the clerk to be effective. They're effective upon vote. Then the next morning, file them with the, the, the town clerk. Then they are effective against everything that follows thereafter. If right. the application precedes the adoption of new regs, 
the application will be pursuant to the old regs. So we're likely to get an application next week. Before next Pressure. Thursday. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> um, well, I think we, it would, well, that's just a, a bit disconcerting because I think there's some um, technical changes, technical conforming changes that should be done pr prior to that. And those are just conforming to the town council form of government that should be done uh, before any um, comprehensive permit is received, permit application is received. Um, and I would, would hope that the developer would wait for us to put the, to finish our regulations and, but I, you know, we haven't had a, I would, we have not had a conversation with the developer to do that. I think that would be smart or show good faith, but they are free to do whatever they're going to do. Mr. Um, Chairman, if, if this is helpful, the board could vote. I'm not suggesting this just, just as an option. The board could vote tonight to make changes to the regs that you feel are so critical um, that they need to be made. Mm -hmm. And they would become effective. I could work with Maureen tomorrow and they could be effective um, upon the filing of, of the, the new regs with the, the clerk tomorrow. If, if you felt pressure. Um, I, I'm not recommending that because I think it's worthy for the board to have a conversation and for the public yeah. to weigh in. But if you felt pressure, if there's something that's so categorically wrong, you wanted to fix before next Thursday, you have convened this meeting, it's properly advertised, and you're having this colloquy right now. You, you could do that. Well, I, I think we should do the, what's required by the change of governance. That should, we should, could do that. That's been um, sh shared with the board. We've discussed it. I think we all that's those are really kind of conforming changes. I think those must be done. I don't feel that there is. Uh, I don't feel comfortable in going further than that. Separ separating each into new sections for every type of action we can take. Those kinds of things I think need to be shared with the board before we act. But um, I think we all know exactly what the conforming changes would be. And I would, I, at the end of this discussion, I'm going to seek a motion that we make those changes. Instruct you and staff to work those through and file them. Uh, as quickly as possible, sharing them with us before you do, right? But that you've done as quickly as possible. And then we still proceed to work towards more comprehensive changes in the hope that the app, that there isn't an application filed before Thursday and we try to, and we get the uh, new regulations on Thursday. That's how I would like to proceed then, given that we may have a, an application before next Thursday. David? Yeah, I, I was having another thought. It goes back to earlier when we were talking about quorum. Maybe with that in mind, maybe get that hammered out tonight so it's clear if there's any language you want to change. But you already have, it's a five-member board that stated at the beginning under Section 1. But under mm -hmm. quorum, just lay out the different types of um, cases that you handle and the, the quorum needed for each. And that would at least cover you for now. And then if you want to change that when you do the breakout, you can put it in that place. But I think having quorum be such a, uh, a focal title there, it makes it easy to find and it can easily spell out each one. Good suggestion. So then as we work through, I think that's a good suggestion. John, you got that? And yep, I do. Christine and Maureen, okay. Um, so as I work through the, through the um, regulation, rules and regulations, I think we have to do just this, this change to town council, just I'm select board to town council, um, the place where we have to put four instead of three because we're now a five member board, make those kinds of conforming changes. These are all things that we have uh, has been shared with the board members. I think the quorum that you talked about, David, makes sense uh, just, just to um, uh, identify the different quorums for each of the different actions and what the, quorum, what the power of the quorum can do, what, what it can be done. And um, I think those we can have ready by probably by Friday afternoon and could file them on Monday morning. Yes, Christine. Well, the one other thing I would add is the Mullen rule. Um, the section, uh, chapter 39, section 23D to allow a member of the board who um, wasn't able to attend a particular hearing date um, to read the material and, and catch up and then be eligible to vote. That also seems pretty straightforward yeah. and um, necessary for 
you moving forward with this um, expected permit application? Yeah, we should, now does the town council have to approve that for us or can we do that, take that action on our own? The town council has already approved it for the zoning board of appeals. Okay, so, now so we should take that. Put it in your rules and regs, yeah. All right, that's good. Okay, I think we have a sense, unless there's any other discussion, I think we have a sense or a consensus here on what, how we should act uh, in the short term and what we do coming up. So I will uh, entertain a motion that we um, move to amend the rules and regulations as we just discussed, including the Mullins rule. And uh, I'm looking for a motion to, and a second. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Sh Sharon? Second. Do Keith, you want to, got it? Do you want to get any uh, members of the public uh, to weigh in before you vote on that? Or I don't know. I no, don't know. If you, you know, I, no. I think I think not. We'll have at the end of this. I, th okay. I think we should discuss this and move on this. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Any discussion on the motion? Excuse me. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Motion passed. All right. Um, I think, and then I'm sorry, may I just say something? I think yes. that these um, Zoom meetings require a roll call. Oh, they do. Good catch. And I think, and I also think that only regular members can vote on this motion. I think the, uh, it says at the, under current regular uh, rules and regulations, regular members shall also adopt or and or amend rules and regulations. And then it goes on to state that other issues, all people, can, all members can vote. Oh. So on this one, we just have the five members voting on this, the five regular members. So uh, roll call would be uh, Joan, um, Ms. O'Meara. You're on mute. Is that or not? She needs to be unmuted. Yeah, Joan, unmute. There you go. I am unmuted. Is that right? <laughs> now yeah. you are. And, and are you okay. an I? Yes, I. Mr. Lansdale? I. Ms. Parks? I. Mr. Maxfield? I. Mr. Judge? I. Five in favor. Motion is passed. Um, the next is to discuss uh, if we should proceed with changes. Um, and before we do that, I you said there were a couple of comments from the public? Uh, uh, right. There's one member of the public present. One member of the public. All right, keep this to three minutes. Um, and is it, a, and it is all I don't know if they topic. have, I don't know if they have comments. This is a okay. public hearing. Yeah, I know. Well, it's a public meeting, right? No, it's a public hearing. This is. Okay, then public should be heard. Uh, Hilda, do you have any comments? If so, uh, you should uh, press the button to raise your hand. Oh, she does. Okay. Hilda, I'm going to allow you to talk. Yes. Uh, my hand is not raised. I just did it now when you asked me, and my hand is not raised. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. I'm, well, just, I'm just covering this for the newspaper, but I don't have a question. Oh, okay. Well, right. it was great to hear your voice. All right. I want to hear my comments. You'll read about it right. in the book. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. The next next order of business is to authorize. I mean, I, unless there's objections, uh, we'll staff will work with um, John uh, Witten and I to try to come up with um, changes that we as we discussed and pr provide those to the um, uh, to all of you prior to next week's meeting in time for us to consider the rules and regulations uh, in concert with our meeting, our hearing and meeting next week on next Thursday. Um, unless there's any objections, I think that's how we'll proceed. Great. Any um, other comments? Yeah, Christine. I have a question for John Witten, which is um, you did not close the public hearing when you voted. So could you Having taken that vote, continue the public hearing to next Thursday, so then you wouldn't need to re-advertise. Yes, yes, I think that's a great suggestion. And um, you, again, the board can make additional additions for next Thursday. I, I will, I will have the 
my draft to the chair and to Maureen over the weekend. Um, Maureen, I'll have it to you on Monday if that works for you. Sure. And then mm -hmm. the board will, you know, you'll be kind of teed up to, to file with the town clerk on Tuesday for these, these more technical things that we just talked about. And then I'll also have proposed revisions, substantive revisions that we've talked about as well. So the, the board's vote for tonight was to file the, those minor changes for Tuesday morning. And then there'll be a second round of recommended changes that the board hadn't reviewed. We've talked right. about, but the board hasn't seen. And you can deliberate on those when you meet on Thursday. If, sure. And so just to repeat, you, you will email me the draft of the minor changes tomorrow or by Monday? If, if, if it would be helpful to you, I can get them to you tomorrow if you were going to file tomorrow. If you're not going to file tomorrow, then I'd rather take the weekend. But that's up to you, Maureen. I'll do whatever you would prefer. Um, well, it's up to Chris. Wait, how do you? I think it would be better to do it tomorrow. And then yeah. yeah, I would too. Okay, yep. then I'll, 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 you know, if you gave me till about one o'clock, would that work? That's perfect. Okay. So, and just note that Monday is a holiday. Right, right. Yep. yep. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, since, uh, as okay. uh, uh, I think Christine just pointed out, <clears throat> that we didn't close the the meeting, uh, the hearing, would it be possible uh, if uh, Mr. Witten gets the substantive changes to Maureen by, well, as soon as possible, do we have to wait until Thursday to then vote on them? Yeah, we, uh, we, you guys, if you want, if, if people are agreeable, we could schedule, uh, we could continue this to Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. We could, we don't need to have it in a um, previously announced meeting. We could have it. Uh, yeah, because you're continuing the hearing. So um, as long as you make that motion to continue it. You just need, yep. to, oh, you just need to post the meeting. You know, just watch out for the 48 hours. And oh, yeah. So today's Thursday. Uh, so the earliest would be, I think, Tuesday? Well, you don't. That would be. Uh, no, or Wednesday. I meant to say yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. I think you might as well just wait till Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, we, all we get is a day. And I think you may want to spend, I don't want to rush people on, on the changes. Um, okay. So, but, uh, and Bob, you had a point you wanted to make. So, um, I'm not the only new person here. Um, and so maybe this question maybe other people would feel it would be helpful. I, I would like to hear from staff or Steve or anyone who wants to comment what, um, and maybe this was said in the beginning too, but what are, we tr what are the major things that we're trying to do? Uh, I know one is that we're trying to get the document to reflect the fact that we no longer have town meeting, we have a town council. I know that Steve had mentioned about separating out each function into its own separate section for clarity, but what I'm also getting, um, well, there's two things, just to give you my own kind of new member impression. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised to hear that the ZBA has so much latitude at granting waivers. I coming in I didn't think it was had you know could just like wave all these things uh, so uh, I don't know if I'm misinformed about that but it might be good to comment on that and the other thing that I'm most interested in 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 reviewing the document is what what, what do we see as being our vulnerabilities I, I'm kind of hearing like we feel vulnerable and the thing about the 10 percent affordable housing came up i know a little bit about that and uh, amherst isn't in that category of vulnerability but uh according to the comments i'm hearing for john uh makes me feel like we do have vulnerabilities that we need to protect ourselves 
And so this is hard for a new person. So I, mm -hmm. when I review this, I'm going to depend a lot on uh, town staff and like Chris, who's been here a long time and has a lot of experience and a good sense of the town. Uh, a, a lot of my judgment will have to be guided by town staff, I think. So uh, could somebody comment to those? I don't you know, I, I think part of the, the well, John, I'm going to ask you or, or Chris to talk, but I think part of it is the waivers is unique to the comprehensive permit process. But, but John, go ahead. So the, the town is vulnerable only when it loses the safe harbor. So having the 10% subsidized housing inventory status is not permanent. When the new census comes out, your numbers are likely to go down because the 2020 census you've added over the past 10 years, units to the denominator. When you add units to the denominator, it changes the percentage of affordability unless you're equally adding the units to the numerator. So cities and towns that were at safe harbor may be below safe harbor when the census comes out. That does not look like it's gonna to happen to Amherst but it's not exactly clear. So it's never a permanent status. Amherst is never permanently protected. So you wanna have your regs in place for both the possibility of falling below 10%, as well as being able to work with an applicant to support the kind of affordable housing that Amherst wants, whether it's family housing or elderly housing or whatever Amherst's most specific needs are. So that's the basis for the regulations. Because you cannot say no to an applicant from applying, you can say no to an applicant after you go through the public hearing process. You want to have regulations on the books that allow you to make informed decisions. I mean, one of the things about 40B is if you are at 10% now, you need to maintain the 10%. So you're under constant pressure. I'm not saying this is a negative or a positive thing. It just is a fact. Cities and towns are under constant pressure to maintain safe harbor. And the way to maintain safe harbor is to continually approve projects that count on your subsidized housing inventory. And of course, that's what Amherst has done successfully for so many years. So it's a bit of a, a, a bit of gamesmanship in the sense that you got to continue to maintain that number. You never want to fall below. Once you've kind of tasted the holy grail of being consistent with local needs, you don't want to lose it. So having regs to support the projects that you want to endorse are really, really valuable. So you're, you're vulnerable only in the sense that the statute does not allow cities and towns to sleep on their laurels. You got to keep producing. And this is a way to produce in a manner that's consistent with your planning agenda, you know, in terms of where, how many, what type, who should be providing them? Is it the municipality? Is it the private sector? Is it a nonprofit? So it really gives you a lot more leverage. So that, that's why I'm a big proponent for strong kind of broad local rules and regulations, especially in the, con the, the condition that Amherst is in, which is you've achieved the holy grail, you're there, and now you want to maintain it and protect it. And sir, I don't, I, don't think, I don't know if that answered your question. You, you, you're really excellent questions. I, I, I get it them all. Uh, I, I had a, a quick question that I wanted to ask here. You said it's um, on the census when that comes back that we'll, we'll know whether or not we maintained or lost our safe harbor. Uh, assuming we, either way, however that goes, let's say we lose it, uh, is it only 2030, the next census, that we could get that back? So we would it would be gone for 10 years. This is the problem. It's not quite that, it's not quite that uh, black and white. If you lose it, you can bring it, get it back again through uh, the, if you, the board remembers the workshop that we did, when you get a comprehensive permit application, you'll have a chance to say, no, we've got it back again. So you won't have to wait till 2030, but the official census is where the denominator gets locked in. So it's really important. And that's why I say, based on the growth that Amherst has experienced since 2010, you know, in a lot of other cities and towns, we're going to see a lot of communities that have lost it, that had it, that lost it. They got to now get it again. And you're going to have to invoke it each and every time 
you get an application. Good question. Yep. Ms. Bresta, Chris? Uh, yes, yeah. so um, we, we do have um, some good news. Nate Malloy in uh, the planning department did a study, I think it was about a year or two ago, where um, he projected out to the future, given the um, developments that we knew were coming along, and he felt that we would be safe for um, several years into the future. Um, we do have um, units being produced. We had 20% uh, of the units at um, Beacon at North Square. Um, <clears throat> they would um, compensate for others who didn't include affordable units. Um, so uh, we had 26 units up there instead of what might have been 10%, uh, which would have been 13 units. We've also gained units on University Drive and we're gaining more uh, with the Aspen Heights development on Northampton Road. So we're in the planning department, we're always thinking about this, but we feel re reasonably comfortable that we'll be okay for the next few years. Great. Mr. Meadows, you had a question? Uh, it, it's simply the same thing. Can we get some statistics as to what those numbers are now? So that we, I, I appreciate that that he feels that we'll be good for the next few years, but could could we possibly get those so that we have a stronger idea what what those numbers are? Yes, Mr. Greeny, I think you had a follow up question. Yeah, uh, you're you're muted. Um, let me direct it at you, Steve. You've been on the um, board for a while, and Tammy and Joan. Um, what, what do you see, other than this uh, affordable housing 10% issue, what other goals do you have in uh, revising the regs that we, when we look at the documents, should be looking for? Just to have yeah. a, like an outline of what are the important areas that we should be looking at? You know, one of the things is readability is part of what I would choose to try to get. I remember when I first read, when I first joined, I tried to, I read these rules and regulations, trying to understand the role of the board, what its powers were, what the procedures were required, and I was confused. And I didn't know all the difference between the variances and the special permit and the comprehensive permit and the appeals to the building uh, inspectors or building commissioners rulings. I didn't, and I didn't understand all that. So I think they're well written, but I think they're, they're not clear to an uninitiated person. They certainly were clear to me and I've learned a lot in reading them. So number one, clarity. And I think you can, clear that you can get more clarity if you, uh, sec if you separate these in sections by function for one thing. I also think you can get more clarity if you lay out exactly what is required from developers and applicants. And especially in the, spe in the comprehensive permit, there's a lot that can be, that we should require uh, because we do have this extraordinary ability to waive so much of the town's rules and regulate so much of the law and regulation in town in granting this that we ought to be very precise and everybody ought to know we ought to know and the developer and the public ought to know exactly what we what is required of the developer in bringing that um and bringing something to the to the uh, to the zba for approval i think that's very helpful i think specifically laying out the pro forma in, for comprehensive uh permits makes a ton of sense. We don't normally get into that with on special permits or on other kinds of, of efforts, but we do, we will want it here because that's part of, you know, these are not, the nature of the, the developer are, is not the same as the, as, as the commercial developer we have in a lot of cases. So I think that this, the pro forma would be really important to have, and I think that'd be a good change to make. And lastly, I think that by doing all this, it does help the public know exactly what we're doing, gives us greater credibility. If we have rules, process, clear process and procedures, we follow those, those process and procedures provide for public comment, they provide for public input, and they provide for us to, uh, a basis for our deliberation. And I think those are all good. And that's what I would hope to achieve uh, generally, you know, from a 30,000 foot standpoint. It looks like Hilda has raised her hand. Um, Hilda? Yeah. I knew about labels with 40B, but other than that, I had never heard of special permits 
being allowed to waive the zoning bylaw. In fact, I always thought that you're not supposed to make something more non-conforming than it already is unless you can invoke 9.2 and, and satisfy those requirements. So I'm just curious if the zoning board can't give waivers except in a 40B, how can the planning board give waivers to zoning requirements when they give a planning board special permit? And since town meeting have been working on that issue of trying to get developers to put in affordable housing, but they pull, you know, if, if they get a special permit from the planning board, they're supposed to put in affordable housing, but they've been finding all kinds of loopholes around it. I just, curious how there can be some kind of consistency in granting special permits between the two boards. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? That we never, as my eight years on the board, I never gave a waiver except on a 40B, and then along comes 1 East Pleasant Street and other buildings, and there's waivers for everything. Yeah. I don't know the answer to the height, you name it, and and their regular developments, and and they got around the requirement for affordable housing. So I'm just sort of curious how this works out politically. Okay. Well, I think I bet Miss Bresta has an, an answer for the difference in the powers of the two boards. Um, but we're really going to focus on what we can do as as the ZBA. But um, for, for pointed information, can you answer Miss Greenbaum's question? Um, there are Excuse me, it's 11.28. They both have to satisfy, right? 11.38, I mean. 10.38. 10.38. 10.38, I'm sorry. That's the end of yeah. Ron, Ron yeah. I'm sorry. It depends on the type of waiver that you're requesting. I know. Um, there is in, um, in, chap in excuse me, Table 3 of Section 6 of the Zoning Bylaw, um, yep. which is the dimensional uh, requirements. As Ms. Greenbaum knows, there is a footnote A that allows yep. um, the um, permit authority to grant a special permit for waivers or modifications of certain dimensional uh, requirements. And that does require a special permit from that particular board. And what they're supposed to do is look at the um, dimensions and um, yeah, the dimensions of the surrounding neighborhood and try to um, match those to the best of their ability when they're considering whether to grant a special permit or not. So it is something that's um, written into our bylaw. Um, the planning board doesn't just grant waivers kind of willy nilly unless they're actually written into the bylaw as being something that they're allowed to do. Okay, interesting question, but not right on point to the things we have to deal with uh, in this meeting. So I'd like to move on to any other comments or questions before we um, continue the meeting until next Thursday. Okay. I think we're all clear on what the next steps are. We'll have a draft from um, an outside council. We'll get that draft and for first for the immediate changes t tomorrow and we'll file those as quickly as possible. Those are really non-controversial. The bigger changes, the more substantive changes we'll try to have on Tuesday. We'll take a look at them, make sure that that's something that I'm comfortable and the staff is comfortable in, in distributing and we'll, we'll distribute it to the rest of the members as soon as possible. All right. Well, I, that concludes this part of the meeting. Uh, we'll move it to, we'll continue it to we next week. We have a week motion? And we have a, to, yes, to, to move it. Uh, do we have a motion to continue the meeting till Thursday? Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. May I count uh, that as a roll call vote? Oh, we have to do that. I'm sorry. You're right. It's, it's, this is <laughs> Zoom rules. <laughs> yeah. in, in, in more ways than one. All right. And, and again, I think we're going to, this will be the um, regular members. So, um, board member O'Meara. I'm here, Just, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Mr. Aye. Langsdale. Yep. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Judge votes aye. All right. We also have the uh, public comment period that happens after, at the end of every meeting, 
and hearing uh, on matters that are not before the board tonight. Um, so we have the opportunity for the public to make a comment at that. Are there any public comments? All right. Meetings uh, continued until next Thursday. Thank you all. Go ahead, Christine. Say what time? What time? Six. Until six, six, six o'clock. Six, six p.m. Yep. Six p.m. next Thursday. Um, do we need that, to do that? Go ahead. I was going to say, I guess you guys should unfortunately need do another motion to adjourn. <laughs> we adjourn. Oh, yeah, I guess we have to do that too. Yeah. Even though we're even though we're continuing this, we have to adjourn it. Yeah. All right. A motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote is required. Uh, Commissioner O'Meara, or Board Member O'Meara. Aye. Member Langsdale. Aye. Member Parks. Aye. Member Maxfield. Aye. And the chairman will vote aye. Motion passes. All right. Thank we'll you. see you all on Thursday of next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.